We gather here tonight before the cross in sorrow and in shame. We look for forgiveness, strength, and mercy, though we know we deserve none. We gather to remember how it was the day that our Savior died. To remember, to mourn, to try to remember what happened that day. The day that Jesus showed the depth of his love for us, for each one of us, by suffering and dying in our place. Let us pray. Father, our hearts are heavy as we gather in the name of our crucified Lord. We watch with horror as we see him hanging on the cross. We see the evil in the world around us. We too, Father, have denied our Lord. We too have betrayed our Lord. He died for our sins. Forgive us, Lord, and love us still. Amen. He was born in an obscure village, a child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter shop until he was 30. Then for three years, he was an itinerant preacher. He never had a family or owned a home. He never set foot inside a big city. He never traveled 200 miles from, pla from the place he was born. He never wrote a book or held an office. He did none of these things <coughs> that usually accompany greatness. While he was still a young man, the tide of popular opinion turned against him. His friends deserted him. He was turned over to his enemies. He went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled for the only piece of property he had, his coat. When he was dead, he was taken down and laid in a borrowed grave. Nineteen centuries have come and gone, and today is still the central figure for much of the human race. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned, put together, have not the effect the, man, the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. It was a long night. It had been a strange night. So much had happened. Few of the older Jewish people sensed it was going to rain, but perhaps that was only to make conversation between the stories that were running rampant. There was a great deal of unrest, confusion. Most people were unaware of what had happened on the second floor of that inn. They knew that a man many people were calling the master rented the room for a seder. But then most homes were having their seders during the Passover and normally everyone would have rested well after any seder. But not last night. They learned that one of his followers, a man called Judas, had left the inn and went to the authorities. A little while later, a group of soldiers with torches and clubs seized the man from Galilee. Rumor had it that he was a revolutionary. He was planning to seize the throne. Well, they certainly could use a change. The conditions people were living under were terrible. And if any man could do it, why, he would have a great number of followers. So he could be a threat. Everyone loves a winner. The crowds had cheered his entry into the town only a few days before. But last night, or during the early hours right up to now, well, there was something else that was happening. Some of the men were talking about the way he was dragged to court, 
how he had appeared before Pilate and had been sent to Herod finally back to Pilate. They reported that he had been beaten and a ring of thorns was draped around his head, mocking him as a king. Well, they said he was the king of the Jews. But what had he done to deserve all of this? Some said he had blasphemed. And when the crowds had been given a choice of the release of a prisoner, that they had cried out for Barabbas instead of Jesus. But why? Well, who knows why? Under strange conditions, people do strange things. Everyone had seen the huge cross that he was made to carry. Some saw the beating he received on the way to Golgotha. They saw him fall and how Simon came to help him. Women wept. One man who was down front gave an account of the stripping of the garments and the nailing of his hands and his feet to the cross and how they raised that cross high on the hill facing Jerusalem. Huge crowds had come to see him. Actually, they, they had come to see him die. A centurion and other guards of Herod, as well as many soldiers, kept the crowds far back from the scene. All except his mother and a young follower named John. Oh, there were some other women near, but no one seemed to recognize them. And there at the foot of the cross, Jesus' mother knelt and wept. And so there he was, the man called Jesus, hanging between two thieves who were also to be crucified. to the yelling of the crowds and looking down at the sight of these men gambling for his clothing noting their terrible anger the thoughts running through his head of that horrible trial of the scourging and the crowning of those thorns that long journey the weight of that cross the tremendous injustice Jesus raised his eyes looking beyond way beyond beyond time and beyond space Look, looking toward heaven and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive whom? Forgive his enemies? The soldier in the courtroom of Caiaphas who struck him with his fist? Pilate, the politician who was to condemn the Savior of mankind to regain the friendship of Caesar. Herod, who clothed the divine wisdom in the garment of a fool. The soldiers who hung the king of kings on a tree between heaven and earth. Forgive them? Forgive them. Why? Because they know what they do? No. Because they know not what they are doing. If they knew what they were doing and yet continued on, if they knew of the terrible crime they were committing, but sentencing their very salvation to death, if they knew of the perversion of justice it was, to choose Barabbas over Christ, if they knew what they were doing yet continued, unmindful of the fact that the very blood which they caused to be shed was capable of redeeming them, Perhaps it was only the ignorance of this great sin 
that brought them near enough to hear the cry from the cross. But yet, forgiveness is there for any who but ask. People at the time of dying either proclaim their innocence or condemn the judges who sentence or ask pardon for sins committed. But the one who was perfectly innocent asked no pardon. As the one chosen by the Father, he extended pardon. As high priest, he offered himself in sacrifice. He pleaded for sinners. Those tormentors around the cross awaited his reaction. They were quite sure that he who preached, Love your enemy, and do not judge others, would now forget such teachings while experiencing the pain of the nails and cross. Everyone anticipated a cry, but no one, with the exception of the few faithful followers who remained at the foot of the cross, expected the cry that all were to hear. Two thieves that hung on either side of his cross were crying out in pain. One cursed and swore, and remembering all that was going on, remembering that the man in the middle was called to by so many names, a savior, a messiah, a king. So he let out a stream of profanities toward Jesus, finishing it off with, if you are the messiah, then save yourself and save us. With that the other man rebuked him, saying, Have you no fear of God at all? Seeing that you are under the same sentence, look, we deserve what they are giving us. We are guilty. We are paying the price for what we have done. But this man, this man, he's done nothing wrong. And then he turned to Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me. When you enter into your reign, and to this Jesus replied, I assure you, this day you will be with me in paradise. The two thieves crucified on either side of Jesus at first blasphemed and cursed. The thief on the left asked to be taken down, but the thief on the right, Dismas, evidently moved by our Lord's prayer of intercession, asked to be taken up, reprimanding his brother thief for his blasphemy. Dismas said, Have you no fear of God? You are under the same sentence as he. For us it is plain justice. We are paying the price for our misdeeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then throwing himself upon divine mercy, asking for forgiveness, Jesus, remember me when you come to your throne. A dying man asks a dying man for eternal life. A man without possessions ask a poor man for a kingdom. A thief at the door of death asked, for the, asked to die like a thief and steal paradise. One would have thought a saint would have been the first soul purchased over the counter of Calvary by the red coins of redemption. But in the divine plan, it was a thief who was the escort of the king of kings into paradise. If our Lord had come merely as a teacher, the thief would never ask for forgiveness. But since the thieves' request touched the, touched the reason of his coming to earth, namely to save souls, the thief heard the immediate answer, I tell you this, today you shall be with me in paradise. It was the thief Dismas' last prayer, perhaps even his first. He knocked once, sought once, asked once, dared everything and found everything. When even the disciples were doubting and only one was present at the cross, 
the thief owned and acknowledged him as the Lord and Savior. If Barabbas came to the execution, how he must have wished that he had never been released and that he could have heard the words of the compassionate one. Practically everything about the body of Christ was fastened by nails or tortured by whips and thorns, except his heart and his tongue. And these declared forgiveness that very day. But who can forgive sins but God? And who can promise paradise except him who by nature is eternal to paradise? Let us pray that we will hear those same words that Jesus said to Dismas. I assure you, this you shall be with me in paradise. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon now, and a few dark clouds were in the distance, but the sky was a pale blue. The crowds were still there. The soldiers were still mocking him, and the pain in his body was mounting. Looking down at his mother, and she looking up at him, his thoughts were many. Why did she have to be there? Why did she have to see this? Why did she have to suffer this way? Even though pained, unbearable pain, he looked past himself and saw her and thought much of her, much as he would have loved to have been in her arms as he once was as a child. And her thoughts, what mother wouldn't do anything and everything in her power to spare her son from any pain? Yet here was the mother of Jesus, frustrated that she couldn't stop this. Jesus knew her thoughts, and seeing young John standing by his mother there, trying to communicate some words of comfort to his mother to take care of this young man, and to ask him to take care of her, his precious mother. But the pain was unbearable, and the eyes blurry as he tried to stay awake and trying to breathe. He blurted out the words, Mother, behold your son. Almost 2,000 years ago, at a place called Golgotha, we were given to the care of Mary, the mother of Christ. She, who had given physical birth to the Son of God, was now given to us as mother, in spiritual sense. It would take a woman as strong as she to have, to have that role, the one who nurtured and taught the child, the child who now, as a man, hung on that cross at the place of the skulls. She who nursed the hurts, the bumps, and bruises of a little boy. She who held him close and dried his tears. Now, who was there to dry hers? She had been in situations similar to this before, when he'd been rejected and ridiculed, and she hurt inside, feeling some of his pain. It's, not, it's the not understanding why that's especially troublesome. The same wise we all ask, why me? Why now? Why this? Through all this, the not being able to understand, <clears throat> Mary can be seen as a woman of faith. Faith in God's plan for herself and those whom she loved. Mary then is the model for us, a model of acceptance. From the beginning, when the angel announced that she would bear a son through the life of this son, and here, now at Golgotha, Mary responded by accepting in faith, a faith which stills the restless questions of why. During this Lenten season, 
pray that we can be able to have our faith deepened to the point where we can be more ready to accept our own situations of trial. From this hill outside of Jerusalem to here and now, the words of Jesus take on a new meaning. Woman, behold your son. of perspiration, sweat, grime, and even blood, blood dripping from the top of his head, part of the blood sticking in his hair, those thorns digging deeply into his flesh and into his skull. Several times along the road and carrying that tremendous weight, he tried to reach to his head to pull a strand of the thorns away, but they only cut his fingers. And so blood was dripping from them as well. Racked by pain, a face covered by this dirt and blood, a face, a warm face with eyes that saw right through you, deep penetrating eyes, eyes that were now almost closed. With tears of pain, looking at the heavens once more, asking, no, begging, here on the cross was not a superman, but a human being, put to the severest test of all. Was he abandoned? Was he forgotten? Pleadingly, he looked to the heavens and cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you, God? I've cried out to you, but my voice resounds like an echo. All around me is darkness, and I cannot see your face or hear your voice. I cannot believe you would leave me alone with no one to comfort me, no one to speak to, no one in whose presence I can cry without shame or laugh, laugh without explanation. To love me as I am and accept what I want to be, even though I fail miserably in attaining my goals. I know your spirit is within my heart, Lord. I know you guide and sanctify. But yet, Lord, I am in a dilemma. Where shall I go? To whom shall I turn? Did I hear you speak, Lord? You solved my problem. Do I see a smile on your face and hear you say, My foolish, foolish child, don't you know or did you forget that I have given you my only son whose presence is in the holy sacrament that when he was crucified he offered himself as the eternal sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice for the salvation of all humankind. In the ninth hour of his sacrifice, in darkness, he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that cry, my son Jesus did not feel his life's work was a failure, or that I had abandoned him. His cry represents the persecuted upright man who trusted in me, their God and Father, 
Their fathers trusted in me, and I delivered them. To me they cried. To me they escaped. This is the same cry my son makes. A cry to his trusted father. I did not turn my face away from him. I will fulfill my vows to all who fear me. I have fulfilled them to each and every one of you. In my son, he is here. He is present to you. Come visit him. He wishes you to receive his body and blood. He wishes you to speak to him in sacrament. He wants you to cry out to him. Yes, cry out to him. Thank you, Lord. Maybe I have been unsure. Maybe I wanted to forget. Your word proclaims he is here. The service proclaims he is here. The holiness of your flock proclaims he is here. I fear the Lord. That it is my own weak faith. That is the real cause of my dilemma. You have not left me, Lord. It is I who refused your friendship. You have not left me without sympathy, Lord. It is I who did not recognize your compassion. You have not left me without comfort, Lord. It is I who have refused your consolation. You have not left me without courage, Lord. It is I who have refused your encouragement. Forgive me, Jesus. I will not want for compassion ship again. There is nothing in all creation that will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's hard to see what was going on now. People were pushing and shoving, trying to get a better view. <clears throat> One man asked another, what is that sign above his head? What does it say? King of the Jews was the reply, and they laughed. Some king hanging there, dying there. Gradually, all the clouds disappeared, and what was seemingly a pale blue deepened in color. Then the whole sky began to darken to a robin egg blue, then to an even darker blue. Some were murmuring that a storm must be brewing. They started for the gates. A few women began to fling their shawls over their heads. Others were talking or taking their children to shelter before the storm broke. The people muttering, never was there a day like this. How right they were. There never was a day like this. The skies never behaved like this. All the earth marks of a storm, yet no thunder and no lightning. Not even a cloud was there. The skies darkened even more until the darkness of dusk descended over all. Then the people were really afraid. Some of the elders tried to calm them down, telling them that it was nothing. A few thought that they were in for a sandstorm, but the elders said no. They had never had a sandstorm of more than minor proportion in the city of Jerusalem before. Some of the soldiers full of wine and dozing near the big rock were hoping for the storm to come quickly. They were bored with the slowness of the execution. With each second the pain mounted. Jesus' body screamed in agony. The arms, the limbs, the, the nerves were pulled so tight they were like strings on a violin. No food, 
nor water for over 14 hours. Jesus, looking down on the people, many so far away, those that might have helped couldn't, those that wouldn't, screaming up at him, mocking him, taunting him, looking for at least a kind word or thought, Jesus mumbled, I thirst. I thirst. We can easily understand how these words might come to be uttered by this man, Jesus Christ, as he hung in agony upon the cross. Because they seem to be so in place, their deeper meaning can be overlooked. Beyond Jesus' immediate need, there is a deeper spiritual meaning. This thirsting is not just for liquid to remove the dryness and dust from his mouth. This thirsting is really for you and for me, for all who were and for all who will be. For us to recognize our humanness, our failures, our shortcomings, and yet in spite of all these imperfections, we are sought after. We are wanted for you, for me, for each and every one of us, Jesus says, I thirst. No, we don't really deserve this attention. We failed so many times, and more than likely we will do it again. What's the use? What's the sense? It is because we're loved that it makes sense. We can be forgiven. We, not, we need not be lost. There is hope. This man on the cross, bearing the weight and agony of our failures, says, I thirst. And this thirst is for each, and for, for each of us. This thirst shall motivate us to try again, even if we have failed. In our darkest and most dismal deeds, our uncaring moments, in our apathy, there is still hope, forgiveness, love from a God who cares. Forgive us and try again. Didn't Christ fall three times on the way to his death? We are not to lie there and wallow in our self-pity. Christ wants us up and moving, moving towards him. Not too long ago after this event, on which we now meditate, a man called Saul stood by and held the cloaks of others who murdered, who stoned to death a man called Stephen. Yet even after this, this man named Saul was overcome by the thirsting of Christ. Who are we to question the way of his love? Who are we to determine that forgivability of our actions? Who are we to judge others? Because of their failures, we need only to know we are accepted, we are loved in spite of our humanness, in spite of our failures. Here, in this time and place, in Bethel United Methodist Church in Shawnee, the message remains the same. For your hearts and souls, for your very life, I thirst. High on Calvary, Jesus faced the holy city for the last time. Death was coming slowly. Fatigue and the wounds of the hands and the feet and even his head, they were not fatal in themselves, but the constant pain forced him to move in agony. His head lowered, his chin was touching his chest. <coughs> muscle spasms, muscle cramps, pain in the wrists, that were unbearable, and his forearms knotted, his shoulders aching, his ribs almost breaking through the skin. His muscles at the side of his chest became paralyzed, so much so that he could draw air into his lungs, but he was powerless to exhale. So he raised himself up on his bleeding feet, his weight coming down on his instep, and that single nail pressed hard against the top of his wound, causing excruciating pain. 
Then he could raise his shoulders so that he would be on a level with his hands and he could exhale. His breathing became more rapid. Unable to bear the pain below which cramped at his legs and his thighs, he let his body sag lower and lower. Over and over again he would repeat this process. What was left? What part of his body didn't ache now? What else could they possibly do to him? What else could he possibly do for them? Here and now, Scripture was fulfilled. Jesus had been obedient. He had faith in the Father, struggling for a last, final breath. He gasped, It is finished. It is finished. Christ uttered these words after experiencing a lifetime of pain and suffering. Commit your mind's eye to picture Christ nailed to the cross that day on Calvary. Observe his body sagging under its own weight, his arms stretched to their furthest points, his legs bending at the knees, and the nail holes being stretched as his body sags. For three short hours in history, the hill called the Skull became the dice, the place on which was erected the throne of the King of Kings. It is evident that Christ suffered and died that day on Calvary. The question is why? You and I are the answer to that question. It is recorded in Scripture. The greatest love a person can have for his friends is to give his life for them. John 15, 13, 14. John, Jesus does love us. It is finished. The mission given Jesus by his Father was nearly finished. The only thing remaining was the resurrection. God, Jesus came to earth as the good shepherd to guide his flock, you and me, to salvation. Again, Scripture records, I have come in order that you might have life and have it abundantly. John 10, 10 and 11. We are the evidence that Jesus was successful. It is finished. Implies a new beginning. We are the new beginning. You and I must live Jesus' words and examples to our brothers and sisters. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? John 11, 25-27 It is finished, my friends, or has it just begun? Death was a usual thing in Palestine. Often children would die of sickness. Beggars would die on the road. <coughs> After a few hours, the people, for the most part, lost interest in Jesus. Only a few of the high priests remained. <coughs> 
close to the cross with the centurion and his soldiers. Then the long quiet began. Even the birds were hushed. Little olive trees and wild flowers held a steady pose in the still air. The only sound was the moaning of the men on the three crosses. Often someone would yell, he's dead, or he's not moving. The excruciating pain would cause fainting from time to time, but not for long, because although unconsciousness was most welcome, Jesus could not breathe, and the pain became worse and worse, but it was still not over. Panting, gasping, he hung there, waiting. Then with the last ounce of strength left in him, he pulled his weight up one more time, and with the, the words almost choked out of him, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Father, I was born to serve our people and to show them the truth, the way, and the life. I was baptized to show them that they could be cleansed with water and the Holy Spirit. They condemned me because I was doing your will and trying to lead them in a righteous way. I was scourged by the soldiers who spat upon me and mocked me, calling me King of the Jews, not knowing that I would be King of all people. They placed a crown of thorns on, upon my head, not knowing that they would be turned into crown of jewels. How they mocked me, not knowing that some would believe at the last moment and that one day I would judge them. Father, I fell from lack of strength in my humanness and no one reached out to help me, not knowing that someday they would fall and I would reach out to help them. They nailed me to the cross, not knowing that it was your will for me to suffer for their sins and the sins of the entire world. I forgave them as they cast lots for my clothing and they mocked me for not saving myself, not knowing that it was your will, not mine, that was being carried out. They did not realize that I am giving my life for them, and there is no greater act than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, and they are my friends. They shall learn to repent, not knowing that we love them, and shall forgive them. And so, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. sound went through the air as though a herd of animals had stampeded underground. A fresh breath expelled its breath on the wildflowers. The earth trembled and a small crack broke through a part of the ground around them. The big rock of execution split. gate of Jerusalem and through the town and into the, the temple separated. Suddenly the big inner veil ripped into two from top to bottom. A 
tombs in the cemetery began to crumble. The whole countryside was shaken. Centurions and the soldiers jumped to their feet. They came to the foot of the cross and looked up at Jesus. Fear came over them at the sight of the split rock. Screams of the people, the earth opening, the sounds of the winds, the torrent of the rains that were pouring down. The centurion looked up into the face of Jesus, taking off his helmet, and then bowed his head. All those that were near him heard him say, Truly, this was the Son of God. thorns on his head, a spear in his side. Still, it was a heartache that made him cry. He gave his life so we would understand. Christ himself, my friends, is standing here with us, his face full of glory, his eyes full of tears. If he reached out his arms with his nail-pierced hands, tonight, is there any way that you could say no to this man? Could you look into his tear-stained eyes knowing that it's you he's thinking of? Could you tell him that you're not ready now to give your life to him? Could you say that you don't think you need his love? Tonight, this very moment, Jesus is here with his arms wide open. You can see him with your heart, thorns on his head, your life in his hands. He's thinking of you. He gave his life for you. He's done all that he can, and he's left it up to you. Would you bow with me in prayer? Lord, as we depart tonight, help us to reflect in our hearts upon who we are and what you have done for us. Help us to understand and an understanding to accept your love and your forgiveness. Make us a people who have your faith and your courage during this hour of darkness. A people who, like you, Lord, walk in humble obedience to our Father's will. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. My friends, we have gathered here tonight before the cross in sorrow and in shame, looking for forgiveness, strength, and mercy. The altar is now open. You may come to our Lord. You may come to the altar. Or you may remain in your pews and meditate, or if you choose, you may leave in silence. Blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.